Okay, hello everyone. <coughs> so, uh, I, Dr. Sachin Kadam, welcomes you all uh, in today's uh, interesting webinar topic. Uh, I would like to introduce today's guest. Uh, it's my really uh, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dipti Malhotra Kapoor. Uh, Dr. Dipti has earned her biomedical uh, PhD degree in uh, medical biochemistry from uh, Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Delhi. Her doctorate thesis was on identification of molecular markers for suicidal behavior associated with unipolar depression. Professionally, uh, Dr. Deepthi has been fellow of the uh, Directorate of Forensic Science under the Ministry of Home Affairs, a visiting faculty at National Institute of Criminology and Forensic Science under the Ministry of Home Affairs. She is currently working with PETA, as, uh, PETA India as a uh, science policy advisor. Dr. Deepthi is one of the founding member of Society for Alternative to Animal Experiments India. A life member of uh, Indian Immunology Society, she is a member of uh, Expert Committee of the Bureau of Indian Standards. She is an active member of several Expert Committee under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. As an expert in non-animal uh, methods and global trends and uh, harmonization. So she'll be talking today on very interesting topic, which is on modernizing biomedical research and uh, regulatory testing. We all know that uh, now uh, research is like, you know, moving in a very good direction, wherein we are minimizing or literally avoiding use of animal for our experimentation. And this uh, animal's uh, experimentation place is now been taken by molecular uh, tests and several other tests. So, uh, today's webinar is, uh, you know, will be focusing on more on these technologies, the regulatory affairs uh, pertaining to all these technologies and how we can, you know, literally go animal free uh, when we talk about science, basically a biological research. So without any further delay, I would like to uh, uh, invite Dr. Dipti and uh, Dr. Dipti Dias is uh, uh, for you now. Thank you, Dr. Sachin, uh, for this uh, quite elaborate uh, introduction. As he mentioned, I'll be talking about how we can replace uh, use of animals in biomedical research. Um, uh, uh, if you can uh, make me the presenter now, uh, Sachin, I'll start my presentation. And during the presentation, just uh, uh, one thing that I'll be switching off my video. And once our session is over, uh we can have a live interaction if that's okay with everyone i hope it is because i've been facing some internet issues so uh really want to have this session go without any glitch um uh let me know sachin if i'm the presenter now or if i can make myself the presenter Okay, I can do this. Uh, so can someone just confirm that if you can see my full screen? Uh, yes, we can see your screen now. <clears throat> great, great. great. So, so thank you everyone and good afternoon everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Deepthi M. Kapoor and as Sachin has already introduced me, I have a doctorate in medical biochemistry from Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Delhi. Currently, I'm with PETA India as a science policy advisor. And my work focuses on non-animal methods and its adoption in uh, research and regulatory testing to help benefit humans and animals alike. Uh, in today's presentation, I'll first uh, introduce my organization, its affiliates, and the work that we do at PETA India. 
I'll then discuss uh, why testing on animals is a bad science, focusing on the finan uh, economical, scientific, and legal aspects. I'll uh, then be focusing on a strict tool that we have developed to modernize biomedical research and regulatory testing to replace the use of animals with modern <clears throat> scientific methods involving in vitro and in silico models. And uh, I'll then discuss as an example, the reason and the ways for replacing the use of animals for antibody production. So I'm really looking forward to interacting with you during and after this session. So let's get started. As many of you may all, uh, know, PETA India, or People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals India, it's a non-profit organization with prime focus on uh, saving animals' life. Our mission statement in part reads that you can say, see over here that uh, animals are not ours to experiment on. And that is the mantra for our science department. We and our affiliates have 18 scientists on staff. And here you can see we're all uh, in the countries we have our affiliates. And we have 18 scientists on staff who work <coughs> full time to encourage the use of robust in vitro and in silico models to replace the use of animals in research, teaching, and regulatory testing. Now, the, our work includes funding method development for in vitro models, holding informative workshops, webinars, meeting with regulatory agencies and companies, and participating in scientific meetings and conferences, and in uh, informative webinars as, or sessions as we are participating today. Now, PETA India is recognized and registered as an expert member in several subcommittees of the Indian regulatory departments, such as Bureau of Indian Standards, the Indian Pharmacopoeia, and also gets invited to special meetings of the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Science and Technology in India. Now, some of the successful collaborations example <clears throat> between PETA India and Indian regulatory authorities through the work of such committees include ban on testing of cosmetics on animals and certain household products, the decision of the Ministry of Health to stop requiring duplicative testing for new drug registrations for the drugs which are already approved abroad and internationally, and a decision in favor of non-animal test for acute dermal and ocular rabbit test Adoption of non-animal test waivers in the test required for registration of chemical pesticides in India. Removal of the requirement of abnormal toxicity test from the individual monographs of vaccines. <coughs> Excuse me. From the individual monographs of vaccines of, for human use, which are mentioned in the Indian pharmacopoeia. So these are uh, some of the successful examples. And of course, our work entails a lot more than what I've mentioned here, but it, it's there to give you a proper picture. Now, coming to the topic of why testing on animals is a bad science. You know, the use of animals to try to understand human disease or to predict human responses to substances has long been a dominant paradigm in biomedical research and regulatory testing. Yet, as time passes, we are becoming increasingly aware of the failure of animal methods to establish both efficacy and toxicology risk and the inherent problems associated with the extrapolation of data to human populations. There are multiple factors which contribute to the failure of animal experimentation to predict human outcomes reliably. And some of these factors include that uh, there are intrinsic biological and genetic differences between the species to contribute significantly to problems in extrapolating results from animals to humans. Now, also, the artificial diseases that get created in the laboratory, it is not the same as naturally occurring conditions in humans in the real world. Now, another aspect to consider is the immense pain and suffering to animals. Instead, we can use more predictive test based on human cells and human disease mechanisms. A great deal of scholarly research shows that animal tests are flawed and diverting economic and intellectual resources and taxpayers' money from the methodologies 
<clears throat> suited for protecting human health than investing on a uh, test on animals. Now, it's interesting to note that India's gross expenditure on research and development through the Department of Science Technology has consistently increased over the years and has more than quadrupled from 24 crores in 2004 and 5 to 104 crores in 2016 and 17. And this information is as per the data shared by the Ministry of Science and Technology and the reports are available on their website. <clears throat> and a part of the, this funding is for animal experiments. However, the inherent faults in the concept of using animals to study and understand human biology, biology, disease progression in humans and testing treatments for diseases lead to wastage of taxpayers' money. It's well known that about 95% of drugs that pass tests in other species fail in human clinical trials. The best way for utilizing taxpayer money is to focus on driving future national economic growth by, the dev by developing inventive intelligent technology and encouraging outside investment in the life sciences. And non-animal techniques <clears throat> are one of the emerging fields with growing economical potential. Now, in addition to the economics, there are many factors that all play in the failure of animal models to predict human outcomes reliably, including reporting and publication bias, poor study design, and inadequate sample size. However, the weakness of animal experiments cannot be overcome by simply improving the study design. The intrinsic biological and genetic differences among the species contribute significantly to the translational problems. Scientists nowadays are acknowledging that exploring human research methods can lead us effectively to achieve our research objectives than the over-reliance on animal studies. <clears throat> you know, in, to, uh, in the year 2019, around May or August, the Indian Council of Medical Research, they published a paper in Nature, emphasizing a push for emerging technologies such as organ on chips to replace use of animals in experiments. One of the authors is a well-known Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, and she, along with other authors, acknowledged that though the move would require a costly overhaul of the drug approval process, the non-animal technologies can outperform animals in their ability to model human diseases. Now, in addition to the scientific factors, there's also legal reasons for why one needs to shift or consider non-animal methods. You know, Russell and Birch, they established the principles of three R's, that is reduction, <clears throat> refinement, and replacement of the use of animals in experiments about more than 60 years ago. And India has attempted significant efforts to ensure the adoption of these principles. We have a dedicated act, namely the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act of 1960, which regulates the use of animals and lays out the rules and guidelines to prevent animal abuse in general and in experiments. The chapter four of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act specifically discusses the prevention of cruelty to animals used in experimentation. It also gives due consideration to replacement of animal use with non-animal techniques. When you, if you go through uh, the Prevention to Cruelty to Animals Act, you'll see the section 17, part D of the act states that when an alternative to animal model is present or is available, animals shall not be used for experiments. And the definition of experiment under the act, which is mentioned in the breeding of an experiments on animals control and supervision rules, states that experiment means under the act, under this act when, where, animals are, uh, where animals are used in experiment, the definition of experiment means any program or project involving the use of animals for the acquisition of knowledge of a biological, physiological, ethological, physical, or chemical nature. 
It includes the use of animals in production of reagents and products such as antigens and antibodies, routine diagnostics, testing activity and establishment of transgenic stocks for the purpose of saving or prolonging life or elevating suffering or significant gains in well-being for the people for, of the country or for combating any disease, whether of human beings or animals. Hence, replacing the use of animals in biomedical research and regulatory testing is not only a step towards progressive science, but it is also mandated by the law. Now, given the crucial need for such a paradigm shift, PETA, India, uh, PETA has developed a roadmap for modernizing the scientific landscape and to end the use of animals in experiment. The roadmap suggests <clears throat> five critical steps. First is the immediate elimination of animal use in areas for which animals have already been shown to be a poor and unreliable predictors for humans and have impeded progress. Now, the past quarter century has seen a revolution in the way in which chemicals are tested with non-animal test methods. And there are multiple reviews which have already documented the overwhelming failure of animal use to benefit human health in multiple disease areas. By eliminating the use of animals where the disease models are failing, or where full replacements exist, and by promoting the regulatory acceptance of the methods which are currently in the development, we have an opportunity to shift the research and testing paradigm further towards innovative techniques and become world, world leaders in the application of these methods. The second critical step includes conducting critical <clears throat> scientific reviews to identify the areas in which the use of animals can be ended immediately. For those areas of investigation where there is still some question as to whether the use of anim animals is beneficial, a thorough systemic review should be conducted to determine the efficacy of using animals. Furthermore, the law and rules laid under the Prevention to Cruelty to Animals uh, Animals Act, as I previously mentioned, mandate that due preference be given to non-animal methods wherever it's possible. It also extends that a sound justification must be provided to explain if animals are used in experiments where an alternative or a non-animal models are available. Now, to keep with, uh, to keep a pace with the scientific innovations, it is vital that this process be focused and time <coughs> is be focused timely and to maximize the process potential. It is vital that scientists, regulators and other stakeholders actively look into these reviews and these criteria. Now, the third critical step is implementing an ethical harm benefit analysis system through retrospective evaluations. In addition to the mandatory prospective project, evaluations to establish whether the objective of projects were achieved or not, the respect, <clears throat> the retrospective project evaluation must be treated with more attention than just being a tick box uh, process. And to prove useful in future decision making, uh, decision making programs, these retrospective evaluations must be robust, publicly accessible, and feed into the thematic reviews required by the committee for the purpose of control and supervisions of experiments on animals. Now, this committee is a statutory body that is formed under the Prevention of Control, uh, Prevention to Cruelty to Animals Act, Chapter 4, and it looks into and uh, its basic work is to ensure that unnecessary tests are not performed onto animals. And any uh, organization or a researcher who wants to use animals, they need to take a due permission from the CPCSCA or their Institutional Animal Ethics Committee, which is further a subset of CPCSCA. So it is necessary that 
<clears throat> the future decision making of retrospective evaluations it must be robot and theme uh, and a necessary and should feed into the thematic reviews required by cpc sca like at present there is a form b for approval of protocols for using animal meats and now in it's essential that it needs to be more dynamically analyzed than as i said before just being a tick box exercise the fourth step uh, the fourth critical step is to harmonize and promote international acceptance of non animal testing methods for regulatory toxicity testing requirements the acceptance of non animal techniques in one country or by a regulatory organization it opens the door for international and global harmonization and a broader statutory elimination of animal testing methods therefore we advocate that the national and international regulatory bodies and standards organization lies with industry research agencies and relevant non government organizations worldwide to establish and promote clear paths to the validation and harmonization of non animal techniques and we further recommend that regulatory and government agencies enforce the authority as india is a signatory to oecd mutual acceptance of data which means that the countries which are signatory uh, to this data they can accept the data which is generated in a validated or a well regulated lab the fifth critical step is g is the request of redirecting funds from animal studies to the development of non animal methods now very recently <clears throat> the government of india announced the covid-19 research consortium and other initiatives for funding research on ways to prevent treat and control the disease and <clears throat> is actively investing in research and development now diversions of funds from animal model based studies to non animal model studies including but not limited to in vitro models in silico models big data analysis development of 3d tissue models will further strengthen the research in the field the research modernization deal that we have prepared which is a strategic tool <coughs> in this deal we have provided specific examples and way forwards for replacing the use of animals throughout each critical step uh feel free to you know visit our website which is spidaindia.com or uh, mail me if you want to know more about the research modernization deal if you want to discuss it or get a copy of it um does anybody have any questions or anything to discuss now or should i continue and we can take questions at the end I think we'll take questions at the end. That will be easy for us. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Now I'm uh, I'm stepping into the other part of my presentation, which talks about the antibody production and replacing the use of animals in antibody production. Now uh, the drugs under the category of antitoxins and antivenins, that is the anti-snake venoms. they are the medicines which contain antibodies to treat certain infections such as diphtheria rabies botulism or snake bites and scorpion bites or spider bites <clears throat> these drugs are life saving drugs that target or bind to and stimulate an immediate immune response to a toxin at a molecular level <clears throat> however for more than a century these antitoxins have been produced in the same way that is by injecting the toxin and then purifying the toxin neutralizing antibodies or antitoxins from the blood of these animals so first an toxin is injected into the uh, horse and then its blood is taking uh, uh, then they are bleeded so that the <clears throat> purifying toxin neutralizing antibodies can be extracted and further processed and horses are most often used animals mainly because they are large animals with large volume of blood circulating that can be drawn and used to isolate the antibodies that constitute the final antitoxin product the process of regularly bleeding animals is known to have severe impact on the health of animals 
and the animals are subjected to this process of repeated toxins, injections, and blood draws for years and even for their entire lives. I've shown here a brief uh, uh, a picture from National Institute of Health, which briefly discusses, or I should say humanely discusses, how this process is taken on and what are the steps. Now, the care of thousands of horses and other equines, which are housed by the drug companies in India and abroad. The, the process of taking care of these many number of horses alone is a Herculean task that many factory farms fails to maintain the minimum standards, or apparently fails to maintain, I should say, the minimum standards. Now, through the Right to Information Act, we, uh, PETA India, we obtained uh, inspection reports, photos, and videos of an inspection that was done by a special team uh, arranged by the Animal Welfare Board of India. And the inspection done by the CPCSA in 2017. The inspection done by Animal Welfare Board of India for nine facil Indian facilities, which are housing around five, which were housing at that time around 5,000 horses. Now, we asked for their pictures, videos, and uh, reports from the agency, and through RTI, we were able to get it. Now, the pictures on the slide here are those which we have taken. Some of these are just some of the pictures that we have taken, and they depict some of the welfare concerns for the horses. We also have a video on our PETA India website depicting the ground realities of bleeding process of equines. If someone is interested to see how the bleeding process actually happens, uh, you're most welcome to go there. I just share a word of caution that they are pretty graphic. So it's at your discretion whether you're interested or want to see those or not. Now, coming back to the reports, the reports by the expert team, which was appointed by the Animal Welfare Board of India in 2015, and by an equine subcommittee team appointed by the committee for the purpose of control and supervision of animals, that is CPCSEA in 2017, now, both these agencies' uh, report have documented several apparent violations and uh, apparent violations of the rules and guidelines and issues such as animal in poor health conditions, having improper housing, lack of grooming, improper veterinary care, and negligence in providing timely veterinary care, which makes these animals suffer. Now, the team of Animal Welfare Board of India reported the use of wild boar, needles, wild boar needles for bleeding that is larger than the maximum allowed as per the guidelines and drying the blood that exceeds the frequency and the volume permitted. Inadequate handling and improper management of equines before, during and after the bleeding procedures were also noted in the reports. And such malpractices or negligence, they do, cause, uh, they do cause immense pain and suffering to the animals. Now, there are guidelines available under the PCA Act, which is the care and management of equines for the production of biologicals. And these guidelines, they ask for proper care, use of best practices, and proper veterinary care to minimize the suffering and also in ask that uh, trained, educated staff be employed by these companies and they use sterile, fresh apparatus at the time of beating. There are quite many, uh, you know, guide instructions mentioned there. And the reason for, you know, asking for proper care and use of best practices is because the process of envenoming and bleeding is inherently painful and it's also cruel. The situation of improper handling and negligence while bleeding an animal can even be lethal. <clears throat> you know, just to understand uh, how painful it can be, has anyone among the attendees has ever donated blood or have gotten himself or herself vaccinated? I'm sure must have been, but if someone can answer. Okay. Uh, I am assuming that 
someone must have donated blood in their life or you know have got themselves vaccinated so and you imagine the pain that you get when you get injected with that uh, wide needle when you are donating blood the pain is the amount of pain that you feel or the pain that you feel is something similar to what these animals feel however because of the further wide bore needles and you know the other practices the intensity is several times or several fold higher so just imagine the pain that it would cause and if anyone is interested to know more about the conditions of these uh, horses and equines uh, you're free to visit a website or you know write to me about it this is something that i'm looking into actively now in addition to the uh, welfare concerns with on use of animals for deriving antitoxins and antivenin products there are other uh, issues also related with the use of these uh, animal derived therapeutic antitoxins such as uh, there bear many ethical concerns on ground issues of proper care and management of animals and in case of equines they carry a risk of uh, zoonosis that is transmitting a zoonotic disease to humans glanders is one such disease which is a scheduled disease needed to be noted which means that it is needed to be notified under the prevention and control of infectious and contagious disease in animals act of 2009 it occurs commonly in working equines that means the equines which are employed here uh, in this case for uh, you know uh, bleeding for the purpose of uh, making these therapeutic drugs or the ceremonial horses that you see on wedding ceremonies and functions or the horses that are you know used for uh, drawing cart carts and all so these constitute the ca category of uh, working horses <clears throat> so working equines and so it commonly occurs in working equines and glanders as such is a bacterial infection and the most common source of this infection is ingestion of contaminated food or water contaminated air sores which are produced by either coughing or sneezing and contaminated fomites brought to the animals via grooming equipments and tact may also be a source of infection now the bacteria that causes the glanders can also enter the body through contact with lesions abrasions of either the skin or mucosa through the mucosa and in this case a local infection with ulceration <clears throat> may develop spreading to other parts of the body in the course of the disease now poor and uh, poor husbandry practices and feeding conditions as well as animal transport can also contribute as a predisposing factors for uh, glanders infection in equines unsanitary conditions and overcrowded stables are also a risk factors and most of the signs and causative me uh, agents mentioned here contribute to uh, you know the other issues uh, related with if you are housing uh, a lot many horses without giving them proper care and infection uh attention however and you know there are uh, rules and guidelines and a national action plan for glanders has been put in place so that uh, this disease can be uh, controlled and eradicated from india because it com commonly trans uh, trans get transmitted from equines to animal handlers and from handlers to other people who they come in contact with now in addition to zoonosis have it written yeah adverse reactions adverse reactions are also one of the side effects of uh, uh, animal derived therapeutics now imagine the human body we all know that human body can uh, react to the presence of non human proteins in blood stream which can limit the potential effectiveness of an animal derived therapeutic antitoxin now if the human body is attacking the treatment this uh, less of treatment available to bind to the toxin 
and the likelihood of adverse reaction after humans are administered equine derived anti sera or anti toxin it's well uh, documented in literature including systemic allergic reactions like serum sickness which are caused by their complex mixture of horse serum proteins that remain in the final product because we are deriving equine related equine associated uh, antibodies in, in the treatment so many a times they do still remain in the complex mixture of the serum protein and they cause adverse reactions now along with it there are also global demand for on antitoxins and this demand surpasses the supply that can be produced using animals to produce them now since animal derived antitoxins are complex mixtures that vary significantly from batch to batch the stockpiles are difficult to maintain because uh, the product has a limited shelf life most of the equine derived antitoxins are not available in rifleized form and their shelf life is restricted to one or two years from the date of manufacture in india and this uh, shelf life is uh, as per the instructions mentioned in the drugs and cosmetic act of india now the world health organization for example has published several reports on the difficulty of procuring adequate stockpiles of equine diphtheria antitoxin despite the production of this drug by multiple companies with such critical limitations in side effects of equine derived antitoxins you know it's obvious to ask if there is a better way of making such therapeutics to avoid these pro problems and provide a better solution that will help not on the equines but humans it will help in saving more or human lives better now the lucky for us technologies are available to produce antitoxins without using animals and phage display is one of the most commonly used technologies for producing antibodies without using animals Now, many recombinant uh, based antibodies are available in the market already including several antitoxins and there are many which are in the process of development there is an indian company which has their product a recombinant rabies anti sera for human use and it's there uh, it, they have received their approval since 2017 it's there in india so we know that there is a technique there is a technology and uh, there are products in the market so how are these non animal recombinant antitoxins are produced actually without using animals i think it's a quite obvious question that many of you must be thinking you know the process of making these recombinant antibodies it can be broken down into five uh, steps one is the creation of an antibody gene library then displaying that library on the surface of phage viruses now isolation of the antibodies that binds to the antigen of our interest modifying those and anti isolated antibodies and then producing the selected antibodies in cell culture expressions to get the tailored antibodies as per our need and use it does sound simple and quite easy and but it needs we need to know that in phage display like production of non animal recombinant antibodies we need libraries and these libraries consist of human antibody genes which are presented on phage particles now there are certain types uh, several types of gene libraries that differ by the source of the sequence used to build the libraries so they can be immune libraries naive libraries and synthetic or semi synthetic libraries the immune libraries are derived from the immune cells donated by individuals who have suffered from a venomous bites or other form of toxins exposures or who have been vaccinated against a toxin the naive libraries or naive antibody libraries they are generated using resting b cells from healthy non immunized humans 
than the synthetic and semi-synthetic libraries, as the name suggests. They are made from the antigen binding domains of antibodies that have been man-made, that are man-made, or identified from existing human antibodies or a combination of both. The synthetic libraries are not limited to naturally derived antigen antibody domains that have been produced by human or animal immune system. Now, avoiding misleading tests on animals and asking human volunteers to give blood has been used many a times to treat patients with infections. And uh, this technology harvest this property and this phenomena and isolates the cell and then has used it to make a recombinant technology. I'm going to slightly divert from the antitoxin production and share a few decent examples to you know, help you relate to the technology and its benefit. Like uh, We all have witnessed recently that when COVID-19 pandemic started spreading its swing in India, the government suggested use of covalescent plasma as potentially life-saving treatments. Now, the covalescent plasma, it comes uh, directly from humans who have recovered from the illness and is among a most readily available treatment for fighting such diseases. Now, uh, technology such as phage display, you can, for just for the sake of understanding, you can take it that uh, this technology can be used to produce human-derived antibodies on an industrial scale to treat infected patients without the continual use of covalescent plasma from human volunteers or using animals because it's developed from the cells. And once you have those cells, you can harvest it the number of times. And there are companies, like uh, just to further this uh, explanation, um, there are companies which have prioritized the use of recombinant antibodies. Like a Germany-based company, it's named UMAP. Uh, they took less than four weeks to develop recombinant antibodies, which could block SARS-CoV-2 virus from infecting cells. And then they later partnered with another com company, Boringer Ingelheim, to develop these antibodies as a potential treatment for COVID-19. So this is how fast the process can be. And now coming back to the antitoxin production and back to our track, you know, in uh, 2016, uh, among the affiliates I've mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, affiliates that I listed, we do have PETA International Science Consortium as uh, one uh, lim uh, Science Consortium Limited, which is also one of our affiliates. And they funded a project for developing non-animal recombinant antitoxin for diphtheria. Now, as I've mentioned a couple of uh, slides back, that the process of making recombinant antibodies involve creation of gene libraries in the initial steps. Now, once you have these libraries, I have a small, do um, you say, a video to show you what actually happens. Now, the once these libraries are made the antigen of interest is immobilized on the solid supports such as the microbeads or magnetic tubes then the antibody library is immobilized with the uh, is incubated with immobilized antigen and during this process the selection conditions can be precisely controlled to harvest antibodies of interest now to post this incubation, non-specific antibodies are washed away. Excuse me. Now, in the process of panning, the non-specific uh, antibodies are washed away, and specific antibodies are diluted, and they are amplified in the blood culture. This process can be uh, repeated number of times depending upon the kind of product and specificity that we want. And this uh, selection process, which is called panning, it occurs several times. And with each repetition, the pool of selected antibodies is enriched. When you have the uh, desired uh, antibody enriched solution, 
you can identify them on monoclonal binders through ELISA and you get your tailored antibodies. <clears throat> there are many antibodies which are recombinant antibodies which are available in the market for treatment of diseases such as cirrhosis cancer arthritis and other ailments and uh, because these antibodies are gene sequence defined every batch is essentially identical and can be manufactured under glp conditions that ensure consistency of production without the complication of being a serum product the recombinant antibody preparations can be optimized for stability, including freeze drying, which makes them much more amenable for stockpiling and transport. The other benefits of uh, having recombinant antibodies are speed. Like once an antibody library is established, a researcher or a company which is skilled in the phage display can furnish an antigen specific antibody suitable for research purposes in as little as eight weeks. I've already shared another example with you previously. Now, this is significantly shorter than four or more th once, months which are required for hyperimmunized animals to develop a desired antibody titer. Now, spe speed is boon to facilities and health agencies that require supply of such antitoxins. The other benefit is control. Now, recombinant antibody production gives the researchers control over the state of antigen to which they are making antibodies against. With traditional monoclonal antibody technology, researchers lose control after injecting the antigen into an animal. Now, inside an animal, an antigen could be processed into something different or cut into pieces, and antibodies may be against these altered versions of the antigen instead. Animal-derived antibodies must be tested extensively after they are created in, uh, in the hope that an antibody against the intended antigen has been made. Now, with recombinant antibody production, researchers can guide the production process by adjusting experimental conditions to favor the isolation of antibodies against specific antigens or antigenic antigen characteristics. <laughs> Then is the high specificity. Now, altering, uh, altering the antigens during panning iterations can select for cross-reactivity for recombinant antibodies and negative selection techniques like competition with the related molecules can be used to generate highly specific antibodies that can differentiate between similar targets. <clears throat> Then is the uh, benefit of high affinity. The in vitro affinity maturation process, it allows the production of antibodies with affinities in picomolar to femtomolar range. The antibody properties, including affinity, can be controlled using methods such as increasing the number of panning iterations, adjusting washing stringency, presenting different selection conditions, and adjusting the amount of present antigen and you get a high affinity product. Then this and uh, another important benefit of recombinant antibody is that it is independent of biological immune response. Now, unlike animal methods, recombinant technique allow for generation of antibodies to unstable, toxic, volatile, immunosuppressant or non-immunogenic antigens. For example, the recombinant antibodies have been developed to target West Nile virus and botulinum neurotoxins. Now, in addition, the phage display requires less antigen to isolate a recombinant antibody than which is than the sum uh, than the amount that is needed to in case of an immune uh, immunizing an animal. So these are the benefits of some of the benefits of recombinant antibodies against traditionally made antibodies. Now, the PETA International Science Consortium, of which PETA India is a member, they funded a creation of fully human recombinant monoclonal antibodies capable of neutralizing diphtheria toxin. I've mentioned the publication here. 
and for details please, you may look into it or mail me if you want now this work was conducting was <coughs> conducted at the institute of biochemistry biotechnology and bioinformatics at the technical university of troshwak in germany and working with the project partners the science consortium is now in discussion with the regulatory authorities pharmaceutical companies and global health organizations to develop antibodies to a therapeutic diphtheria antitoxin product that replaces the use of horses and other equines now based on the success of this project and the continued need for non animal replacements for animal serum <coughs> excuse me saying uh, an animal serum derived therapeutic drug the consortium is also funding the development of a fully human recombinant monoclonal antibodies capable of neutralizing black widow spider venom now this work is currently being carried out at the german institute and also at with the uh, health center in mexico and through the science consortium we are also involved in creating more awareness on non animal recombinant antibodies and have we have recently successfully completed webinar series in collaboration with the us national toxicology program interagency center for the evaluation of alternative toxicological methods uh, commonly and popularly known as the nisatem and the european union reference laboratory for alternatives to animal testing that is the equam eurl equam in the first webinar the invited scientists in the series mm. uh, have i exceeded my time uh, mm. you can you can, you can uh, go ahead you have 10 minutes more okay okay i'm so sorry okay so uh, as i was saying through uh, in collaboration with the uh, nicetem and european e ICWAM. we have uh, uh, the science through science consortium we have organized antibody webinar series and in these seven uh, so this these series were divided into four parts and um, in the first webinar the invited scientists discussed animal free antibodies against disease as uh, against disease as rapid response to fight covid-19 the second webinar discussed scientific and economic benefits of animal free antibodies in the third webinar we uh, the scientists discussed the application of animal free antibodies and the fourth webinar discussed uh, we had the scientists discussing the accessibility of recombinant antibodies i have uh, listed the web address for the science consortium here at the bottom Uh, web page, and if you are interested in uh, viewing the recordings of the session and you know more literature on the work that uh, we do through Science Consortium, uh, you can visit this. Or, as I have been repeatedly saying, you can contact me later, or we can have the discussion now. Um. Okay. You know that. I'll conclude by saying that with the greater investment in exciting and innovative non-animal methods and bold policy initiatives, far more promising cures and treatments for humans can be developed. We have witnessed regulatory agencies and companies abbreviating testing on animals and preferring first in human clinical trials to get a treatment for COVID-19 faster. In continuation. and supporting these progressive actions not only will help to bring in faster and effective human relevant treatments this will also elevate the almost unimaginable suffering of millions of animals uh with this i would like to thank everyone for your patience and let me know if you have any questions or queries my contact details are mentioned in the slide and we have uh this is a time and era of uh, trending hashtags so 
being in trend, we have two hashtags that's end speciesism and end testing on animals that's going on. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or email me if you have any questions and if you want to know what is going on with beta and its affiliates. So thank you everyone. I can stop sharing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ditti. It was really a nice and informative presentation. Uh, as you have likely said, like, you know, uh, testing animals uh, for human benefits and then extrapolating those uh, tests for, uh, you know, a human uh, uh, data, like, you know, it's, it's, uh, actually does not fit into uh, a human benefits so your 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 you have really uh, well said that you know uh, somewhere or the other we have to draw a line that you know animals can be replaced by uh, the test which is more close to uh, human uh, testing and uh, it was really wonderful to see the non animal recombinant uh, antitoxin uh, uh, slides you have mentioned so uh, it, it's really uh, very informative and uh, really a great uh, talk i i just hope you you know this talk would inspire all the budding scientists to shift their focus from uh, animal studies to uh, more towards uh, cell lines and uh, molecular tests uh, with this if there are any questions i would uh, you know like to have them uh, right now you can type those questions uh, in the chat box so that i can ask them to uh, dr deepthi uh, there is one question from uh, Ms. Asha. She is asking, how much are the page display and uh, method in which animal use in uh, is not involved in use in India currently for experiments? Okay. Uh, uh, just uh, Asha, just clarify this. Do you mean like uh, price wise? Uh, what's the cost or uh, availability wise if there are laboratories available which conduct phage display so price wise i am not so sure on the commercial aspect as such but yeah there are uh, laboratories and you know research groups available that use this technology and it's not a new uh, it's not something out of the box when it comes to Indian scenario. We have scientists and research laboratories and universities and at industrial group who are working on it. If you are interested, uh, uh, if you can. Uh, uh, so you're saying that are they being used by scientists currently in India? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Uh. So if there are any questions, you can just type it or uh, maybe we can conclude. Uh, you can shoot those questions on our uh, Facebook page and uh, our YouTube page. Uh, will be definitely will be, you know, uh, try to answer those questions. Uh, you have got uh, Dr. Deepthi's email address. You can directly contact her also for uh, the information and uh, the research papers or any other documents which she had mentioned during the talk. So with this, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Deepthi. Thank you so much for uh, you know uh, accepting our invitation and giving this wonderful uh, talk uh, today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sachin, for you know uh, planning this uh, talk and inviting me over. I always like when I discuss with young scientists who. Yeah. My times are not even aware that an alternative can be is an alternative is there or you can pursue your career and use come across many students who you know they cry while using animals but they they're handicapped so yes. i'm happy to share this information and everyone i'll encourage anyone and everyone if you are interested uh, then please uh, do reach out to me you have taken my uh, I hope you have taken my uh, contact details and I'll be happy to answer those questions even later. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, audience, for uh, being such a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.